Tice's lecture tonight um, is uh, in is part of the large amount of programming that he's done that's alongside his solo exhibition at the MSU Union Gallery, which is called Costume Party at the Muslim Temple. It opened last Friday and is uh, open all the way through graduation until May 11th. So if you have not already seen it, I go, I, I like urge you to go. Uh, but also the second half of his work is uh, an engagement with um, New Palestine that's called Palestine, quote, with a new, uh, that is going to be uh, exhibited several times across the month of April uh, in the Digital scholar uh, Scholarship Lab at the MSU Library. Um, and in addition to that, he is also bringing in uh, speakers to address uh, the issues that are engaged, that he engages with in his work. Uh, two of those include uh, Becky Gaines and Michael Dean, who come from New Palestine, Indiana. Uh, and they are, they're going to talk about the museum in New Palestine. That's on April 1st at, uh, what time? Sometime. On April 1st, watch Facebook. It will be on Facebook and also other, other channels. It's okay, guys, you don't have to think about it right now. The, uh, and also, uh, Dr. Sally Howell uh, from University of Michigan Dearborn will come and give a talk called, quote, Will the Real Muslims Please Bow Down? Identity Problems in Depression Era Detroit, out quote. Uh, and uh, and that both of these events are um, sponsored by the co-sponsored by the Muslim Studies program, and we thank Muslim Studies and specifically Mohammed Khalil uh, for his support. Kais, uh, uh, he came first to visit in July, and I introduced him to a couple of people. Uh, since then, he has uh, become friends with a number of institutions at MSU, as well as dozens of people. Uh, and in, it's that's in that spirit that I will do a few thanks. MSU, FCU, of course, Cal, the College of Arts and Letters, the Broad, Jackie Sullivan, without whom basically we would be nowhere. Well, Peebles, same thing. Deb Margolis in the uh, MSU libraries, Mohammed Khalil and Muslim Studies. Uh, and I'll just stick there. But mostly, I'd like to thank and welcome Kais to the podium. Thanks. Thanks, Karen. Um, yeah, uh, I will remember when exactly the time at the end of the presentation, I will, I will have that programming and the times of all events. Um, okay, I will start with uh, thanking everyone uh, for being here. And I want to start from uh, the, the fact that I'm, I'm really, really glad being here and presenting on my residency uh, at the Broad today, today here. Uh, and I'm starting from, uh, from this image and starting from uh, the, this experience that I had while uh, being uh, surrounded or being passing by, by the architecture of this building every day. Uh, this building that's been uh, designed by Zaha Hadid uh, while spending the eight months here at MSU. One of the most enjoyable moments for me uh, was hearing the different opinions about the architecture of the broad from people. Um, this is the work by Wyatt Stonehouse, one of my students last semester, uh, who decided to create an interactive design using a Rupix cube that, that, uh, that, uh, that has the MSU Broad Museum on top of it, illustrated on them. Wyatt, who is interested in the fictional representation, questioned the viewer, do you want to distort, fix, or leave it? Through my fall class last semester, the mirror, the copy, contemporary Arab art, and displacement. My students use this, sp this space where we are right now and the architecture of this place uh, as a source of exploration for their final projects. And I'm so happy to see some of them here. Uh, this is the research-based work by Danielle Fans from her words, the way that Zaha Hadid discusses these concepts around her career, the gender bias of the world of architecture and the representation of her ethnic background to be related and inspirational to woman, woman in any career field or point in life. My name is Qais Assali, and I'm an artist designer 
whose, whose work centers on questions of sites, staging relations between sites, whether between places, locations, or between bodies. Most of the time, usually, my, the body, my, my body is one of the sites. Today, as Karen mentioned, the solo show that I'm having at the Union Gallery, I'm going to have my talk to be having the gallery as the center point to talk about the, the, the exhibit itself and to talk about uh, previous works that I had before in relation to, to the exhibit itself. And the exhibit called Costume Party at the Muslim Temple. Uh, this project is focusing on a site, on one site in Southfield, Michigan called the Shriners Muslim Temple. Who are the Shriners? What is their connection to Arab culture or Islam? Well, they self-describe as a brotherhood, fraternity, and secret society with no real explanation for their Orientalist practices. The Shriners, or the ancient order of the nobles of the mystic shrine is a sub-organization of Freemasonry since its formation in 1870. Shriners have remapped 90% of the Arab world into the, onto the United States by appropriating their uh, the, the names of cities uh, and countries, rivers, uh, Arabic terms, uh, for, its, um, for its meaning, or even without any meaning, uh, for to create their own kind of ch Shriner chapters. They adopt uh, Arab garb, Muslim sy symbolism, and Islamic architecture in their buildings, conduct parades, wearing offensive Arab costumes, but surely they do not practice Islam. Fun, Fellowship and the Masonic principles of a brotherly love, relief, and truth. At the roots of this project is a question about the offensiveness of ministerial performances. I wondered why if one blackface is offensive, then why not the other Arab face or brown face? More precisely, why this mask Masquerade wasn't as widely known or discussed before. First component I'm going to talk about in my show at the Union Gallery right now is a float, a parade float. This float was a collaboration and made collaboratively between me and the Syrian American artist Amanda Asali. We have the last name, but we are not related. After I discussed with her my desire to appropriate the Shriners' form of a parade float to create an empty float that can represent the desire uh, for a muted protest, a float that can be a vehicle to juxtapose the Muslim Shriners' exaggerated loud parades and the Arab or Muslim American communities often silenced political protests. I'm interested here in how these representations or misrepresentations of Arab or Muslim and Middle Eastern cultures affect and shed light on the conditions of the booming local Arab community of Dearborn, Dearborn in Michigan. What is the relation between the historical old-fashioned Orientalism of the Shriners and the contemporary identity of Arabs and Muslims? Does it affect the Arab or Muslim American community? What is the relation between the act of exaggerating visibility in the form of the Shriners parades and squashing Arab or Muslim political protest? And what does a parade float for a Muslim look like? Amanda's wonderful skills in building, sewing, and thinking through her identity as a Christian Arab artist helped us to create a relationship between our identities. We used a torn materials of Shriners symbols, fezzes, uh, symbols or their own fezzes. They wear red hats, uh, Ottoman red hats, or what I call it uh, in Arabic, tarbush, 
faces the the like uh, Moroccan uh, way of saying it, as what I know. Uh, and we also used fabric. We used party store Arab noses to create flowers, Western rugs, and local prayer carpets from Dearborn, Michigan, local businesses. My collaboration with Amanda started in Chicago, investigating the architecture of the Medina Temple, the Medina chapter in Chicago, uh, in the downtown. A former Shriner Temple and circus, but now a Bloomingdale's furniture. Um, this is the building itself. Um, we took a mold of this uh, misspelling Arabic texts around the main entrance. We decided to recreate the misspelled Arabic text and geometry. We casted cement blocks of the casted mold at a current exhibit, exhibition right now, Living Architecture at the 6018 North in Chicago, which is a larger scale exhibition that highlights the influence and impact of immigrant artists in Chicago. So the title of the work is Ahl al Medina Shurafa al Ain. Comes from that the Shriner officer position, Oriental Guide, uh, appears in Shriner manuals as Sharif al Ain. They will use, use it in Arabic, Sharif al Ain. Sharif al Ain means Sharif of the gaze. Uh, Ahl al Medina, Shurafa al Ain, the people of Medina or Medina, Sharifs of the gaze. I would love to, I would, uh, I would also mention Medina is Medina, and Medina al-Munawwara in, in Saudi Arabia. Um, so this, the idea of the title itself, Ahl al-Medina Shurfa al-Ain, considers the materiality of the gazes around the Medina temple and it alleviates the distraction that is the beautiful grandeur of the bawaba or the gate and the theater to focus on the false language and lack of substance the tiles and the drapery uh, contain. For this other site specific piece that I created before, I created a fictional account, letters, a memoir, and a fake key for the International Academy in Palestine, telling the story of a Kuwaiti, Kuwaiti displacement from the West Bank after the Nexa, the Nexa in 1967. A displacement for a Kuwaiti, not a Palestinian, in, in Palestine. This work, done while I was still a student, uh, really began my interest in sculptural and collaborative methods of working uh, you see here a falsely constructed pedestal with perfectly matching tiles, which I created with local artisans. So I, I continued uh, in, a, in a bifurcation way to continue the tiles that is rarely will be used as an industry in Palestine, but to let that culture to go out of the land, to go up. In, in his story that he is, uh, in, in, the, in according to the fictional memoir I commissioned from a Palestinian writer, Hanan Walid, the fake Kuwaiti writer, Ghassan al-Rifai, was forced to leave his childhood home in Palestine with his family during the Naksa 67. The fictional memoir was written and narrated with several other collaborators, Palestinians and Kuwaitis. So the purpose of writing the memoir and uh, doing this work was very important for me to, to confuse the victimhood of our right of return as Palestinians with having a third voice of a Kuwaiti uh, uh, losing their right of return and losing their properties in Palestine. And that was uh, a case that uh, in, 60, in 60s when many Arabs were losing their properties in Palestine. And, uh, I was very interested in, uh, in, in also another component in the piece that was him narrating in his Kuwaiti Arabic accent, 
his story of his right of return, of him still holding the key and waiting for his right of return. So this confusion of, uh, of, his, of the Kuwaiti accent and, uh, and the key that is not for a Palestinian was very important for me in its site specific, not only in the, in the, in the place of the tiles, but also in Palestine for the viewer, the Palestinian viewer. So I seek to engage and subvert national geopolitical power dynamics. I stage questions between sight and the body in relation to my own identity and locale in order to debunk metaphoric surrounding, surrounding contested geographies. That's me. In 1988, a one-year-old Palestinian, child of the stones, child of the stones, moved with his family from Palestine to Gulf Arabia. He never threw a stone, but he used to stand in the morning queue at school with the other students singing the Emirati anthem, trying carefully to replace the word, our Emirates, with our Palestine, with no one noticing. So this work was a documentation uh, for an, or an evidence for, for an act that I used to do uh, very, in a very young age, seven years old. Um, considering national anthems as a Palestinian while living in a diaspora, singing every morning for a place or a nation while belonging to another one. The work is a documentation of my act singing uh, in this performative video documentation, I sing the Emirati anthem again. Um, and uh, at some point, uh, I'm repeating the gesture itself that I used to do in school. And also, I invited other Arab diaspora in Jordan to sing their anthems, which was another participatory project engaged in displaced communities in 2015, a year after doing this work. Going back to the costume party at the Muslim temple. And uh, my journey is going back and forth between the Shriners Muslim temple and Dearborn, Dearborn and Hamtramck communities of Arab or Muslim diaspora in the US. The lights were off. The doors were open. After their annual Halloween party, I went in to do a research, taking pictures and videos of the Muslim temple in Southfield, Michigan. The walls of their temple are lined with the new and old photographs of old white men wearing fez. Men dressed as clowns. Men dressed as cops and robbers. Men dressed as cowboys and Indians. Men dressed as Arabs. What an endearing boys club. These men fund hospitals and host parties. What could be wrong with that? In their temple, shaped like a tent, in this fun house of mirrors and American flags, I see slogan in their conference room, Muslim is family. And the framed naked Playboy centerfold captures my attention. Their mixing of exotic sittings, desert landscapes, fashioned with Arabs and camels, collide with contemporary American stereotypes and the misrepresentations of women. U.S. nationalistic imagery in the Wild West themed room conjures up images of settler colonialism gone mad. This mismatched mirage inspires a confusing sense of absurdity found only in a collection of Schreiner memorabilia. I became interested here in thinking of what these characters have witnessed being inside this Muslim temple, all of the characters that I found there. Through the research, when trying to invoke the spirit of, of the vo or the voice of the playboy uh, of the playboy uh, woman that I found, uh, Ginger, uh, that's the name, Ginger Peachy, an actress who I found in the Playboy archives, I failed yet again, only to find Penny Gardner, whose story of labor organizing 
whose, whose career as faculty in gender and women's studies at MSU, and whose harrowing stories as a single mother supporting three kids as a playboy bunny in Baltimore, captured the entire spirit of my project with the question, what does Orientalism have to do with sexism? I worked collaboratively on this video work that we named it Turath Aw Hadara, Heritage or Civilization, with filmmaker Jose, Jose Luis Benavides. The title is coming from one of the topics been discussed with the local Arab American visual artists from Michigan at the Arab American National Museum on, the part, on this participatory project. The video didn't only help me to capture in time-based format me dancing in the Muslim temple as a method to understand that place, which is similar to how the first Shriner in 1870, uh, such as Walter Fleming and William Florence, took many drawings and notes at a party in Cairo when they first uh, uh, started that uh, uh, obsession. But also, to, to go back to connect the historical archives with the contemporary situation to question our political future. I will play uh, a one, like two minutes from the video. Wow, this is really small. So how do the Shriners see the use and consump consumption of these images of the Arab subjects? I'm sorry for how dark it was, uh, but we were seeing like uh, different images of like a mix between uh, the, 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 the Muslim tarbush and uh, these kind of uh, naked women in the same space and uh, and uh, the beginning was uh, that Halloween party where I first encountered that place and I found myself dancing in the middle of that place. How do these images serve the US 
U.S.'s endless war with and in the Middle East. What does it mean for me to do a research in a place called a Muslim temple and to dance there? How can I or should I become a part of it, to embody it, to use my senses to understand and laugh at this locale? This is another piece, uh, one of the artists that responded and being a part of my show, um, by Reem Taqi, a Syrian-American artist from Ann Arbor. Uh, and uh, the piece, uh, the title of it, Oh My Lord, Increase Me in Knowledge. Another piece that will be soon, next week, in the, in the exhibition, by Michael Howard, who is creating a full fizz uh, made by glass mosaic this size, uh, by mosaic, so much work. And we'll be also in the space of like deconstructing all of the symbols of the Shriners logo. He was very interested in what are these doing? Like the pharaonic face is not related to Arabs. And he's trying to find answers, not finding the answers. And this is really becoming like, uh, um, uh, it's interesting, he was asking me, are we going to invite the Shriners? Uh, and I was like, maybe. Uh, Robert, Smith, Robert Smithson writes that the non site can represent the site without resembling it in a metaphoric relationship. I'm not working with the representation between sites and non sites. I'm framing a linkage that is much more fraught in terms of contested geographies. If a, if a metaphor is stating that something or sight is like something or sight else, the like, the like being the relation. This links back to my interest in the copy, the duplication, doubling, as, as one of the titles of uh, my uh, last class in the, on the Arab Contemporary Arts course uh, last semester was the copy, the mirror. My interest in the archive and collective walking comes from previous video installation piece called Parade that I made it in, in 2015, but it's about parades from 1948 that shed the light on the iconic Palestinian Nakba of 1948, when we start talking officially about the establishment of the State of Israel. Since that moment, as many of you might know, already know that Palestine is under occupation uh, of Israel. Growing up on looking at these images, and 1948 is an iconic and traumatic year for Palestinians, when hundreds of thousands of Palestinians were exiled in that year. That Exiled Palestinians have left and still holding their houses, keys, waiting for the right of return. This work is to question this tiring image for my generation of the key and the collective walking, or what I call, what I call it as a parade of invisibility. These symbolic images for the right of return and the collective exiled people walking became an obsession for me that I keep observed its contemporary effect. I decided to question what also happened in 1948. Anything else that is not what I would expect from 1948 and that iconic traumatic year for Palestinians. It started with me collecting archives of anything can be important or not. From the same year, anything not related to Palestine. And this video installation showed numerous projected images, patchwork, archival clips from the year of 1948. It looks out to the whole world through the, rent, the, through the, the lens of this catastrophic year of trauma and Palestinian collective memory. These various clips include the London Olympics, which was my favorite, uh, beauty pageants in Canada, a Christmas parade, and more. The work aims to create another level of individual speculation towards 1948 by challenging the expected, the common, the known, and the heard, redefining the concept of parade as a concept of a placement and visibility into one of displacement and invisibility. 
the duration of it was 19 minutes and 48 seconds. From the same year, I wasn't really satisfied. I also collected the newspapers from the same year, from around the world. In this work, I freeze the moment of the morning after the Palestinian Nakba. So it's the day 16 May 1948, where headlines and uh, sublines, or no lines at all, were created about Palestine all over the world, either either as a body or in the margin of the world's journals. What reflects now in the world's memory, printed on a newspaper, the series abstracts the historic moment through black shapes collected on four and formed by the outlines uh, of news pieces published in Western journals on the day in different countries. So I start to highlight all of these moments highlights all of the newspapers and to look of how much we took from their brain on the, the day after uh, the establishment of Israel. This work goes back to the moment after the catastrophe and looks into the weight and space or lack of it given by the Western world's coverage of this event. The work reflects a reversed relationship between the content of the media creating a potential type of awareness towards the Palestinian situation on that day and how it is employed as a counter to Orientalist visions of the region. Going back to the party. Tearing and overlapping times and sites, blending my photography and archival practice for the first time for this project. I want to talk about this specific piece. I chose this specific site, Factory of Generalization and Orientalism, as representing the Orient as out of time and out of place. In this image, I'm overlapping Edward Said's choice for an Orientalist painting from 1880 by French artist Jean-Léon Jérôme. Schreiner's butt photograph that I took at the Muslim temple. In addition to the hookah shaped as a weapon, if you see it, it's a hookah shaped as a weapon, or a gun, which I found in Dearborn hookah store. This method helped me to confuse these confused sites that confused me. I mean here both the Shriner Temple and the Arab or Muslim community sites. What it means for the typical Orientalist object of hookah to become a representation for violence, a weapon, from Orientalism to terrorism, I wanted to make a joke of the joke. Ginger, Ginger Young escaping to Hamtramck. Overlapping images from Dearborn and Detroit. On, uh, on uh, Parade of Glory, which is one of the Shriners books that been torn. I'm also including found historical book for Palestine Shriners in Rhode Island from 1913, which is really interesting for me. It's one of the three chapters of the Shriners that has uh, changed uh, its name totally uh, after 11 September um, because of the fact that, uh, like, Palestine Shriners doesn't have the name anymore. It's called Rhode Island Shriner right now. And uh, that's because of that so many people that start to think of the Shriners that they are really Palestinians or they are terrorists, so, but they are not. So they start to get harassed. Uh, so they are really need to control and protect their new generations. So they change the name because they are good people. They are not Palestinians. Uh, so Palestine Shriners is not Palestine anymore. They gave up on the name and it's Rhode Island uh, Shriners. 
the same thing with the one in San Francisco that was called Islam Shriners. Some people start to call them, like Muslim people, to ask them about the prayer time. It's really getting really dangerous. So those facts of like thinking of these moments of how the name or this Orientalist visions can become a part of Islamophobia or can become a part of our contemporary situation is really huge for me to, to find that and to think of this idea of losing the name and fighting for the name of Palestine. I decided to use my experience as a graphic designer and advertising firm. I decided to release characters outdoor, out the secrets, the secret society, but also create a connection between the Muslim and the Muslim in Detroit. I decided to advertise a billboard using the Shriners catch aesthetic with advertising for my new family that I found at the Muslim temple. I start to look where I'm gonna advertise, who's my audience. So I start to look at, uh, uh, I'm gonna talk now about the three billboards that they are incorporating in relation to what I'm doing. And the first one that I'm showing here. Uh, so I start to look at different maps of this country. The Midwest, the Bible Belt, Rust Belt, Jesus Land, to see and to look at which kind of territories or where I want to have my billboard. Who's my audience? So the billboard was decided to be in the middle on, to be located in the middle on the highway between Southfield, where is the Muslim temple, and Dearborn. I love that straight line between these two communities and to create a connection between if they know about each other. Uh, after deciding the location on the straight line highway, uh, I even paid, paid the advertising agency for it. But the billboard was rejected by the advertising agency. A second billboard that has no nudity was also rejected. The billboard, the second one, is in my show uh, as a takeaway uh, right now. The, depre the depressed float can't protest in the streets and the offensive billboard can't shout. Making a conversation between old-fashioned Orientalism, advertising, and contemporary Islamophobia. Those outdoor advertisements can't echo the muted political potentials of Dearborn anymore. Then they can represent my or anyone's struggle for voice. I make a satire of this initial assumption of likeness. I start, out with, I start out with an existing superficial connection between sites based on a surface resemblance, a tenuous crossover related to a name, a language, group, a resemblance in layout. One site is often a form of copy of the other. Through the dopious link, to the original. The copy begins to ask questions of the status of the original. I start from there, the like, as a relation, but quickly I go in another direction. I will go to the other project which, uh, which, ha which, uh, which has the, 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 the obsession that I has, uh, that, that I had since I found about the place that called the New Palestine which is my earlier continuing project on the town of New Palestine, Indiana, and Ohio. There is two, and there is more. Every time I visit this town, it feels like being in a sci-fi place. The new itself in a New Palestine felt like sale. It's about advertising and celebrating a new Palestine. What does there being a Palestine in the U.S. mean to you, knowing the U.S. or Trump just signed the largest foreign aid budget ever to Israel?
That's you took this picture. I think I'm. I guess. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, and that's looking at the other. Uh, that's Ken Pecky. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, the other bank. There's a Palatine in Kentucky, but Kentucky. There's outside the city of Chicago. Kentucky. We we have a problem here. We have an argument over whether it's New Palestine or New Palestine. Uh huh. We, so what is happening? Huh? What ha what happens in Palestine? Because we say Palestine. Yeah. yeah. And I was wondering. I noticed that yeah. you say Palestine, yeah. which is a friendly pronunciation. No, like I think it's German. It's German. It's Hoosier is what it is. Hoosier. So some people say Palestine and some other people say Palestine. Yeah, and the people who say oh. Palestine aren't from here. Aren't from here. <laughs> well, yeah, 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 I did a story on that. Not, not within the community. Uh, yeah, and that's how you differentiate was from here. Yeah, it was that bad. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, <laughs> There's a guy from Indianapolis that drove us over here, and he said, oh, new pal. He yeah, say, new pal. You want a new pal, new pal. So that's a good What's way to, pal? to be safe. <laughs> so that's, yeah. so that's yeah. your best, you know, the best thing. The people in the community do not like for you to say new pal. We don't Why? want that no. on. No, they want new Palestine. Mm. Yes. I, got, I use new pal that's a lot. I know you do. A lot of people do, and I see it in yeah. stories. When I, when I do my return address on my, on my mail, I go to new pal IN. That's just what I put. When they do stories in the newspaper, it's Please. New Pal Dragons. It's yeah. New Pal this, New Pal that. Yeah, especially all those football stuff. Yeah. Because oh, yeah. that's wrong. Uh, it's New Palestine. That's true. Yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> or New Palestine. Yeah, but I put it in the newspaper. I think we should create that. It's Fairfield County. Well, okay, so if I write to Prince, I'll put that in there. I've got the real address on the back. I'm happy. But I can't afford to do it. You're going to hate it too. I think. He's wanting to do something like a tourist type band between yeah. uh, what his, 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 he has many ideas on what we could do to bring people here. Yeah, yeah. And I think I, I would really like that. I mean, there's some things we can enhance. Mm -hmm. uh, one is the wooden bridge. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay. And it's the, most of the wooden bridges in Indiana have a work over mm -hmm. We have a lady. Because of the story. Yeah. We have a lady who's uh, 80 some years old and she would go to the meetings about the bridge. Okay. And the bridge that was there was boards. Okay. And no fire trucks, no buses, nothing could go over that bridge. Okay. When we had a train through town, nobody could get across the other side of town if there was an emergency. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay, so when they built the new bridge, they yeah. they built it over the railroad tracks, not over the water. They built it they built the old bridge to withstand the strength of a school bus and a fire engine and stuff like that. So we could, if there was a train, they could emerge as emerge so all out of concrete. I see. Yeah. yeah, but they made it wood. Okay. And it's the only wooden bridge. So that was Becky Jane's, um, who will be with us at the 360 room at the library. Uh, to share with us uh, about that museum and the history of New Palestine. And she called the title of the pr presentation uh, Palestine with a New. Um, and the screening and the presentation will happen, they will be with us on 1st of April, but the screening will happen on, on uh, different times, like uh, different, it will, it will be a, a schedule for the screening that will be at the 360 to, to literally to displace the museum of, of New Palestine. I will go a little bit back with, with uh, this specific component that I found in the newspaper, the press of New Palestine. Uh, it's an ad uh, inside the, the, the newspaper. It's an ad for a family insurance company that has the slogan, it's not about the house, it's about the family that lives in the house. Stability, trust, security. I found myself very interested in, in, in this, this family and the representation of the American family and the stability of a new Palestinian family itself and thinking of how I could uh, transform or, uh, or uh, uh, send this and share this 
with, with the Palestine that I am from. Um, I start to, to think of, uh, I, I start to find myself obsessed with, uh, with copying that ad several times and overlapping the family on top of the family in screen printing. Those are hands from, uh, hands that I took from uh, the, um, uh, the, um, the, the cemetery in a new Palestine. This billboard is up in my hometown in Nablus right now. That has the advertising for a new Palestine family insurance company in Palestine uh, with full of uh, the details to contact the, the family insurance uh, and to have stability if you want. So this is exactly in Nablus where I'm from in the West Bank. US, but also, I want to talk about how this work is very connected in my brain to, uh, to just raise, uh, being raised in, uh, in, uh, or being uh, living in Palestine with the idea of uh, finding so many campaigns around the West Bank and in other countries, but mostly in Palestine, those campaigns from the, the US aid uh, of like, uh, with the slogan, from the American people with those hands uh, when there is a kind of donation or stuff that is being donated from the USA uh, and framing that as from the American people. Uh, so, and this idea of the advertising for, uh, for um, uh, thinking of the response to that in a way and thinking of this American and New Palestine to be advertised as a billboard again in Palestine. Another billboard, and the third one that I want to talk about is this billboard that is just being up right now in a new Palestine, Indiana, uh, that is uh, taking this, uh, this, uh, this caption of a picture uh, from, it was a caption for a picture that I found in the, in the museum itself, that it was saying for a very historical picture, notice on the top picture, the name of the town was once Palestine before they added the new to it. Uh, there is a sign on the building that says uh, Palestine without a new for a very historical picture. And I found that a very interesting moment for me to think of, uh, um, to think of this, uh, this kind of um, like, what does this mean? Uh, to me, but also abstracting the image from the caption and how the caption will have a meaning without the, ca the, the picture itself and displacing the caption in relation to being attached to the image itself. Uh, displace the, the caption itself and having the sky to become the picture itself when it's, it's in a billboard. Uh, so I, I, uh, I got some uh, questions of uh, uh, who's doing this, and um, uh, what is under there is, um, I'm translating it into Arabic. Mulahaza ism al-balda ala al-sura al-uriya kana yawman falastin. It was once Palestine, and uh, signing it, I heart a new Palestine in Ohio. So this idea of, uh, of having that place to be advertised in Indiana while abstracting the Palestine that I'm talking about makes sense for me. This billboard is also a bumper sticker in my exhibition uh, that uh, is also a takeaway to be again distributed again, to distribute the billboard itself in this size. Um, commercial material as a means of subversion. The image above here is, uh, I don't know if anyone noticed, it was in the video. Uh, it's an artifact selected uh, from the Museum of New Palestine, Indiana. And it has the title. The title of it is what is already written on the back. It's, uh, it's a lost old couple, circa 19, uh, found at 25 East Mill Street, New Palestine, in a trash. 
can, can, in a trash can by Garth Castleman around 2000. So this, I, I remember when Becky was telling me about uh, how she was trying really hard to ask new Palestine people in the town if anyone can recognize this old couple and no one can recognize them. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna talk here about the programming, which is uh, that's called doubling displacement. The programming is having uh, start, started already, uh, started already with uh, with uh, with an event that happened uh, on my birthday in March. Uh, is March two days ago, Monday, uh, in Ramallah, in at the Khalil Sakakini Center, with having uh, Albi Sachs from South Africa talking with my students. Sorry, with our participants in, uh, in Palestine in relation to this class that I will talk about, my current class, but I'll be Sachs with virtually, uh, while Deborah Margolis from the library was leading the event in, in Ramallah. Uh, I want to highlight on, uh, uh, it will be at 5 p.m., the presentation, and at 6 p.m. is the first screening at the 360 room. Um, and uh, there is uh, an event on April 5th at MSU Broad Art Lab, which is a collaboration or like a pa participants be, uh, of grad students and faculty in a storytelling time-based work uh, performance uh, or screening or uh, lecturing. Uh, it's time-based. Um, a very important event uh, by Sally Howell, who's going to talk and give more depth to, to talk about the Shriners with the lecture. Will the real Muslims please bow down? Identity problems in depression era Detroit. Uh, Palestine with a new again on April 10th. Uh, I'm happy that I will be talking about uh, uh, at this uh, uh, discussion and conference uh, uh, about the class education in the context of occupation under the education under siege, which is organized by the Muslim Studies Program. And uh, I would invite everyone to the pop-up exhibition for my students for our class that will be at the MSU Museum on April 19th, the full day from 9 to 5 p.m. Uh, Palestine with a new again and the book launch um, on May 3rd. The class that I'm talking about, that's called the Critical critical geopolitics in collaborative practices that I'm so happy with my students that we are challenging borders of language, politics, geography, technology, and time scale of seven hours, that's the worst actually, to study, understand, and use as a points of departure. We started with drawing our uh, participants in Palestine. There is the same number of students there participating with my students here. We started from drawing them, and they draw us. Through one of our dialogues here with Palestine students in class, are getting feedback from Palestinian context. This was a moment when we were uh, at the 360 room. We were stuck on Zatara checkpoint. Students have many questions on how this is a checkpoint and how it works. We were in a Palestinian checkpoint called Zatara of, of having it, and we were really stuck with understanding what does that mean. Finally, by speaking through others, reading one location across another, or even to transcreate from one side to another, the work might be able to expose st structural conditions of another location. So what does it matter what kind of link I construct between locations? What does it matter who is speaking? I don't exactly know. All I can say is that it matters. I want to thank this full list, and on the top of the list, I will again thank a very special person, Debra Margolis from the library, uh, from very beginning when I came to this school with all of the support, and I'm um, looking forward to her coming back from home, Palestine. Thank you.
Thank you, Kais, for that incredibly rich talk. We have some time for questions, and, um, and I'd be happy to give you the mic or re repeat what you say for the tape. So, who can start us off? Hi guys, um, I know a little bit about this, but I thought I'd, I'd love to hear you talk more about um, your float and, and why you never, were you considering uh, using it in the streets and uh, it, might that still happen and why has not, is that not something you've done yet? Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you for that question. Um, the, the very initial idea was starting from literally inviting or having a parade by the Shriners in Dearborn. And we had those discussions and uh, it was starting from there. And uh, thinking of who's viewing, who's on the side of the street, who's walking in the street. And that kind of uh, social dynamic that would happen. I'm still considering that. Uh, I feel uh, it's, uh, it's, it's open to the community that is interested in, in, in walking or, or letting that float to walk. I think it's not my decision. <laughs> it's, it's an invitation to let that walk. I'm very happy to, to let the float to, to go out from and really to, to, to protest. Yeah. Really? So do you know if anyone in Palestine has called the number in New Palestine to be a part of this new family? Have you heard any? I, I don't know how you would. You would have had to, to contact <laughs> To them, ask but. Palestine or to ask the insurance company? I, I, that's the question. I, what I know that I already added the 001 to make sure that the method of communication is happening. So I did my job. <laughs> I added the zero zero one. <laughs> that really is, it's, it's, I mean, we have to contact the company to see, right? I mean, someone, I'd be happy to do that for you if you want me to call and say, have you got, received any phone calls from Palestine? Just wondering, you know, so if you want. Other questions? Yeah. Hello. Um, I just wanted to clarify one thing. When you were trying to sell your billboards in Dearborn, were some of those agencies Arab-owned? Or were there any kind of conversations of like fear to show it versus just like, oh, it's inappropriate? By the agency, by the Yeah, fear of the Shriners because they are like very powerful. Yeah. It, it was, it, it, I, I, I contacted three agencies, not only one, three of them in, in in Detroit, not that specific location, but other locations, uh, to have the billboard. And one of them is an Arab, uh, Arab community uh, agency that also rejected the thing after they were almost gonna do it uh, with uh, having like uh, indirect reasons for no. Uh, that no, we can do with that budget. And I was like, okay, tell me about the budget that you can do it. Like, and the conversation just stuck when they have seen the, the visuals that I'm presenting. And, and another agency was like, what is the, 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 the reason you're doing this? Why you, give me some context. So giving some context and, uh, uh, but that was really tricky for me to give context for, for, for allowing it to happen there. So most of the time, it's uh, when, uh, when, when having those moments of like sharing, it's about the Shriners Muslim and, understanding or creating an understanding for political, what does that mean of that and orientalism? It, it's like close the conversation. Yeah. But I got refunded with the money, don't worry. <laughs> That's good for me. <laughs> So it's clear that humor is a big um, aspect of your work and kind of confusion and displacement um, as a kind of critical strategy. I wonder if you've encountered um, in some of your conversations with people or um, 
from responses from audiences conspiracy thinking or if you've thought about you know the effects of and the role of conspiracy thinking when you introduce this kind of critical um, humor or critical displacement or confusion or, or if this yeah. isn't something that you incorporate um, yeah um, absolutely <laughs> Um, I think uh, uh, it's the way of how to introduce subjects, especially that I'm in this project I was very interested in participating or engaging and failing and keep going and failing and trying to have different methods of sense of humor or not or uh, to, to try to communicate and engage with the, and uh, there is moments in the video of like uh, um, uh, the, the Arab artist telling me, no, this is not about costuming. This is more complicated. Why you are so obsessed with how they wear and the Shriners, how they, it's not about the tarbuch, it's about the way they think. It's about, that's offensive what they do. It's not about the, 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 the coloring and, uh, and, and those are very interesting moments for me that I found myself uh, uh, trying to, to take that, uh, to make sense for what is the politics of this joke? And what is this unpack the joke itself and try to, to think to collectively of the meanings of that joke. Um, I don't know if that's really answering your question, but uh, I'm really interested in, in unpacking the sense of a humor and what is funny for each, each culture. Uh, what is funny for you and what is funny for me and how is that can, like why Arabs can be on the same page as a clowns and how is that uh, on the same page uh, if it's not a clown? So it's that specific identity to if uh, there is less colors so we can do Arab, no, uh, I don't know. So, um, so I'm interested, I'm interested in sense of humor in relation to, to the work because that will, uh, I feel, uh, we all share that and we all share what is funny. Even we don't find it funny but we can understand why it's funny for you. <coughs> in a way, why it's funny for the other. It's, it's a moment of, of unpacking stereotypes. Um, thank you for your talk and for your beautiful show that I think is a really important challenge to the viewer. Um, I think that the conversations we've had so far with it have been really engaging and interesting. And I'm a little bit curious, I know that it's early in your show, but um, because you've presented work about um, another temple in Chicago versus the work that you're sharing here that's largely based on a group from Michigan, are there things that you feel like are different from those two experiences that you're um, maybe considering how this project moves forward in the future? Or is this something that you're ready to sort of take a side step from and find another sort of source of inspiration? Yeah, absolutely. That, fo that project there in Chicago focused on the architecture and uh, the, the influence or like, uh, yeah, cultural influence between uh, architectures from aesthetic of architecture to another school of architecture and like building a mosque, but it's not a mosque, while the architecture of this building here is a tent. So it's not a really like, uh, it's actually a very modern tent, like it's very symmetrical tent while tents rarely will be symmetrical. So um, uh, that's something also to think about. It's a very Western tent in another terms. Um, uh, yeah, the work here was more engaging the, the society and having the main connection with the Arab community. Uh, that was in the heart of, of this project in relation to um, what is that site in relation to other site and that straight line, the road between the two projects was in the core of, of this project in, 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 while the, the project in Chicago was hot, like heavily exploring the, the, the geometry and the pattern in itself, uh, incorporating archive and bringing from the archive to become a part of the work, to, 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 to manipulate and to be clear in the exhibition that was very important for me in this work. Um, yeah. It's a very rich topic that's just everywhere. <laughs> but I think the specificity of here was just like the, the Arab Mecca, 
of, uh, of like uh, the, the big Arab population and thinking of that in relation to my identity. That I'm myself, I don't belong to, to one of the two. I'm, I'm a, I'm, I don't share so many stuff with, with the Arab uh, American community and that was very important for me to engage with them, to question what does that site mean for us, for them, yeah. Uh, thank you for the fantastic talk. I really enjoyed that. Um, it was great to see how rich and varied your work is. Um, I was uh, intrigued by these comments about the archive that you're making at the end here because it seems like a lot of um, your work is about like a, a misarchive or people who have archived things but in the wrong way um, and that you're going uh, back and responding to this work by highlighting the misuse <laughs> and, the, and the abuse of the archive, I guess you could say. Um, by you know people who have written the wrong history, um, and then you know part of that, of course, is creating these holes and these absences. And for example, um, a parade float where there is nothing on it, or a plinth where there's nothing on it. Um, so it's like you create these frames where information could be, but the information is missing. Or with parade, it's like. 1948, you have all of these events and they create sort of like a frame for the conspicuous absence that would be conspicuous for some people, but you know other people wouldn't be able to see, like you're saying with regard to people's perspectives, being able to either see or not see the absences or see or not see the contradictions or conflicts. Um, so anyway, I was thinking about um, these ways in which you're engaging also, you know, as, as humorous as Elena pointed out. Um, but I was also thinking about, um, you know, invisibility and, and absence. And initially, um, with the way that you had set it up, I was thinking about those absences as being the absence of representation for Palestinian history or uh, Palestinian people being forcibly displaced. Um, and then I was also thinking about um, other absences that are, you know, absent in ways that are also uh, like forms of violence, like um, in terms of race, for example, like the fact that whiteness oftentimes gets um, not read. Um, people who are white oftentimes don't read their whiteness as racial or as a race. And so I was thinking about the Shriners and the fact that they're these, these white guys, <laughs> or at least I assume that they're all white, um, you know, putting on these get-ups, these costumes, and performing uh, like they have another cultural identity that, that they don't actually have. And so I was wondering if with the absence there, if you're both, if it has this multiple valence where it could be, you know, the absence of people whose history is being erased, but also sort of a, um, a recognition of uh, trying to yourself absent these people from the scene, um, or perhaps also um, thinking about uh, the way in which for them, it's possible that their own, it's highly likely that they wouldn't have seen their own racial identity, that it would have been absent to them. That's a great question. And uh, that made me think uh, of how much it's not only these uh, like uh, pretending the Arab culture or pretending the other identity itself, but the Shriners are heavily nationalistic too. So there's this kind of exaggerating both identities at the same time. I know that it's not identity, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way of entertaining of, of that. But it was really interesting for me to see like the heavily of the two symbolism happening at the same time. There's so many Arab American flags and the American Eagle at the same time being uh, presenting the same identity and the same temple with Muslim family. This contradiction in, in these two identities is uh, just really powerful for me to think of that contradiction happening in one, one mixed combined of these two identities that they are creating, that I feel it was uh, very powerful. Um, yeah. All oh, right. Hi. Okay, so I was wondering, you know, you talked about like using, I mean, you use humor and you talk about dancing in these spaces. And so I was wondering if you ever get angry or upset or hurt. And when you do, like, how do you continue to like work within that space, you know, and make work about this? And yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and how I be able to dance, for example. Uh, yeah, um, most of the time while entering there, um, this was for me is just really a weird 
flow of keep changing my feeling towards that place. A moment of I'm feeling, oh, am I exaggerating? They are fine. Like, it's just an influence in architecture. That's fine. It's, it's... But it was very important for me to keep going to, to find that it's not really okay with looking at other ways and looking at the differences between what it means to take that kind of costuming for architecture and how it works when it's about other ways of costuming or it's about costuming, it's more about the identity, it's about the skin, it's about, it's about other ways that is really taking it to another direction. Those moments I feel, I feel like I have my, my feelings or the anger that I have keep shifting between what is okay, what is not okay. And those moments of okay, that's okay is the moments of really challenging me. Am I exaggerating? Am I and asking, asking people of what does that mean? Especially that there is so much about that nationalism of the United States, something that I'm, I'm less familiar with and I don't share that part. And even those parts of like, just keep seeing the, the desert and, uh, and seeing this kind of representations that I know I'm from that place, it doesn't look like that. Maybe it was, like I don't know when Aladdin was doing that. So I always question myself, when was that time? I grew up in those, I grew up in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, I mean, as, as a desert place in itself. But it's not about the desert, but it's, it's more about like all of these uh, cultural stuck generalization for that place and like overlapping Egypt with, uh, with, uh, with other identities that I myself, I'm, I know that much about Egypt. So how is that is representing me in that Muslim temple? So those moments is very important for me as I believe in, in specificity and I believe in, in the problem of generalizing people and how, what does that mean in, in relation to history that is keep generalizing identities. After all, the, the greatest privilege is the privilege of ignorance, right? All right, on this note, the note of anger, oh no wait, um, okay, so this one might be a little out of like the ballpark, but have you ever considered looking at how animation portrays the Oriental? I mean, like whether it's like adult animation, like Family Guy or South Park, or even like Disney, like children animation. Have you ever considered like doing a project about that? I would love to. I would love to. Uh, especially that my my work is or my practice is going more towards design and virtual reality and uh, thinking more of, uh, of digital platforms. Um, I'm very interested and in, uh, in, uh, in just going back to the fiction that's happening in these kind of, uh, and the, where is the narrative is coming from is, is very in the core of what I'm interested in relation to the exaggerating in, uh, in, in these kind of uh, uh, like uh, uh, Disney and uh, like just thinking about that. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Are you interested? I'm actually, yeah, I'm really interested. <laughs> uh, I mean, I don't know. Because, you know, being an Iraqi American, if I like, if I turn on South Park and I see like, or like, I don't know, a uh, Family Guy episode about Saddam Hussein or something, I just think that like the way that they portray them in that is very offensive in like a lot of cases. But I know, I understand Family Guy and South Park is offensive for everyone, but. It's just kind of like, <laughs> you know, it, it does. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.